On today's show, the Celtics lose to the Hawks again. What does it say about Boston's late game execution this time? We also get into the Timberwolves ownership drama and then count down the most important games for seeding purposes left this season. All of that and much more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA Friday. Wes Goldberg here with Tony East. East and West back at it again. However, you might be tuning in. YouTube, Odyssey, your favorite podcast app. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make it every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started before we get to the Timberwolves ownership drama let's start in Atlanta where the Hawks beat the Celtics in double overtime DeJounte Murray 44 points on 44 shots including a game winner over Drew Holiday in the final seconds of overtime the Hawks beat the Celtics on Monday night but the Celtics were without Holiday no Derek White in that game so without two of their better players this time they beat the Celtics at full strength there's so much to get into with both of these teams uh Tony do you want to start with the Hawks or the Celtics I want to start with the Hawks because DeJounte Murray, DeJounte Murray is not good enough clutch player of the year love, baby. That's like his fourth, fifth game winner of the season, right? I believe. Um, a lot of Wes, tough what shots. Is, Wes, what is the, well, he it's funny because in regulation, he was kind of blowing it. I think he missed yeah. like his last four shots in the end of the fourth quarter. And then right away to start overtime, he hit two. I think he, I, uh, he had 11 points in overtime. The Celtics had 10 as a team in overtime, right? Like when, The game was on the line. He took over. What is the podcasting equivalent of taking 44 shots in a game? What would this look like for us? I think it would just be like hot take after hot take. And I do have a hot take coming. It might not be a 44 shot hot take, but I got one. To me, it'd be like we we logged in to do this, to talk about Celtics Hawks. And for 27 of the 30 minutes, you were just riffing. And then I just hopped in every so often. (laughs) Yeah, that that'd be the equivalent of what DeJounte Murray did in this game, but he did pretty well. Scoring 44 points on 44 shots is not like the craziest feat ever, but when it mattered, he was awesome. And that's happened quite a lot. I believe you saw one of them in the building in Miami earlier this season. And they had other good performances. Bogdan Bogdanovich, huge three at the end of regulation. Clint Capella had a really good game. But you know, everybody's gonna make this about the Celtics, and they probably should. I have a take on that in a second, but I think the Hawks are just fun. I like seeing DeJounte Murray play some point guard. And when the when the chips are down and it's a one possession game, he can play, man. He he's got the as Tim McMahon calls it the cojones. He's all over at late in games. Um he takes some really bad shots. DeJounte <laughs> does. Murray does. He takes some <laughs> awful shots. But like you said, you know, it, you had to. Trey Young has not been in the lineup for <laughs> a month is, now. Is very uh, funny. J- no Jalen Johnson in this game, who is maybe their second best player. And so I, he's got to take these shots, uh, but there's probably there's probably a dozen of the 44 were just like awful, like early shot clock contested falling away. But it's like, hey, man, he goes after the game. He says, I didn't want to take 44 shots, but Kobe Bryant would have been proud. I love that. Like, OK, like whatever you got to do to beat the Celtics, man. Um, they're 10 and seven now without Trey Young since Trey Young Ooh. entered the lineup. Ooh. DeJounte Murray has been completely unleashed. I love the shot making, but he had a great contest on Kristaps Porzingis late in the game. Uh, he had another contest on the Jason Tatum miss in overtime. Uh, that that was hugely important. I don't know. I just I feel like a Dejounte Murray led team just has better. Vi- I don't know if it's better than not having like than having Trey Young and Dejounte Murray. I don't know if it's better. I'm not willing to go there, but I know the vibes are better. I think the ball moves a little bit better. And with DeJounte Murray playing like this, all the stats are better since Trey Young went out. They tried to trade him. Thank goodness they didn't trade him before the deadline because now they have him. They love him there in Atlanta. Like, I'm ready to just trade Trey Young if I'm the Atlanta Hawks. And I have the perfect I have the perfect uh, place for him to go. Trade him to Brooklyn. Just trade him to Brooklyn. Get, like, Mikel Bridges back or something. Draft picks, whatever it is that you're going to get back. Trade him to Brooklyn. He's a perfect fit for Brooklyn, Trey Young, because he already has like this hatred, kind of weird single man <laughs> rivalry with the New York Knicks. So he could just take that to the other side it. of the Brooklyn Bridge. And it gives Brooklyn an identity, something they do not have right now. And if you're the if you're the Hawks, just go all in on the DeJounte Murray thing. DeJounte Murray, Jalen Johnson, 
DeAndre Hunter's been playing better recently. I'm all I'm I'm here for all of it. You know, you know what I think is the funniest thing about him taking 44 shots? Hawks started Vic Cresci. Yes. At the fourth. Cressy, I always say it wrong. At the four tonight. He had a really good game Monday against the Celtics. Now he played 35 minutes in this game. You know how many shots he took in 35 minutes, Wes? It was like three. One. One. He took one awesome. and he made it. But like that, that's what 45 shots takes. And I agree with the take you just had because I think that was like the only good appeal for a kind of a lost season already for the Hawks when Trey got hurt is like you one, if DeJounte is awesome, his trade value goes up, which matters to them if they do decide to move him. But two, yeah. you can see what your team looks like with only one of the guards and they're both good, but very clearly not awesome off the ball as often as they have to be when they play together. And so that, that just doesn't fit great. Like they're good players. It's not like the team is bad when they both play, but 10 and seven without Trey says something. Uh, and clearly again, they're both better on the ball than off. Like it's just not the greatest fit. I covered Sabonis and Turner together in Indiana for a long time. Yeah, they mm -hmm. could work together. They're both good players, but more natural forwards made sense. And eventually they moved on. And so I, yeah, I, th I think they, there was a lot of chatter and reporting about, can they recuperate the picks they traded for Murray when they trade him away? Well, no, they can't, but could they get a lot of that stuff back if they traded Trey young? I mean, yeah, he's better. So that's still an asset yeah. loss, but maybe that's your way of at least having a good ish team and having all the assets that you hope to have is, is doing something like that. And I know they made the conference finals, but clearly where they're going right now is kind of rudderless. So I'm with you, but I'm Hawks pilled tonight, baby. What a win <laughs> two in a row. Two in a row over the Celtics. Let's talk about the Celtics. Um, so the late game crunch time stuff is still an issue. Again. I, I I didn't think it was as much of an issue before this week. I thought it was just kind of Boston media freaking out about Boston sports teams a little bit. I thought it was a little overstated. Like you look at all the crunch time numbers and everything and the fact that they're still uh, going into this game 20 and 11 in crunch time games. That's a very good record. I mean, it hasn't been that big of an issue, but Boston media people like to freak out over every little thing. And so, and I guess with a team like the Celtics, you're trying to poke holes in it and trying to find some sort of weakness, but this was bad. And I do think that there are some glaring issues. Uh, first, just what happened. So Jalen Brown takes a tough shot over uh, DeAndre Hunter, makes it, makes it a 112 to 109 game with 40 seconds left. Uh, DeJounte Murray makes another shot. Jason Tatum gets fouled. He misses one of his free throws, so it's not a tie game anymore. He could have tied the game with both free throws, misses one of them. Um, and then on the final game, on the final play of the game after DeJounte Murray or before DeJounte Murray hits the shot, Boston's final possession. Um, like I, it just feels like this team it, it's, it's Jason Tatum getting the switch and missing Drew Holiday, whose defender tripped. This actually might've been the last play of regulation. Missed the last Drew, the Drew Holiday's defender trips while trying to switch on a Drew Holiday. Tatum misses Drew Holiday, ends up getting forced sidelined by Bogdanovich and then takes a bad shot at the end of regulation that goes into overtime. And then they sort of lose the rope in overtime. I, I, it feels like this team just slows down. It goes from like this finesse Swiss movement watch offense that just is clicking and firing. Uh, they do two things well, right? They move the ball well and get open threes, and then they isolate a lot. They do those things at a very high frequency. But it feels like in crunch time, they kind of slow down. They lose the ball movement, three-point shot, five-out stuff, and they end up just resorting to isolation, which this team does a lot of. But I wouldn't say that they're an elite isolation team either. And, and when you're not including the other stuff, it just becomes way too predictable. And so I, that's sort of my observation, at least, about why Boston's crunch time has been an issue. What about you? Yeah, I think that like this was kind of the only knock on their roster construction before the season is just the lack of passing on the team. And mm. it's not like they lost a lot of it in their offseason moves, just a little bit. But when they're humming and they're such a good shooting team, there's always a bunch of spacing. So isolation's pretty easy. And a lot of the passes they have to make are pretty simple because Porzingis with his screening and his ability to score from everywhere. Like they don't need to have high level passes on their team. Obviously they have a top five offense as is, but in moments where the game is slower and the, and the margins are smaller and one, the spacing is a little tighter and two, they just by default, every team doesn't want to turn it over in those moments. So they ISO more. Mm -hmm. And that's just not when they're at their best. And so it's worse than their standard level, which is why it looks bad. Like their clutch record isn't awful, but they just like 
it feels like half their losses are this exact formula that you saw tonight, which is why it's so easy to nitpick it because it feels so common and they're such a good team. I have a take on it, but that's kind of like their, their team in general right now. But that's kind of how I feel about their clutch time play is like, look, maybe it's a huge problem, but also maybe they get to the playoffs and they just beat everybody by 15 and it doesn't matter at all because it's maybe. so atypical for the way they play. Their best play in crunch time was Kristaps Porzingis getting it in the low post, kicking it out to Jalen Brown, and then Jalen Brown making a mid range jumper. I'm like, do that. That's do like, that. Like the get Kristaps the Porzingis ball more post up general. has been wildly efficient for you all year. Like that's not that's not a difficult play. You trust Kristaps Porzingis to make that pass in crunch time every possession, every time he has the ball. So it just it feels like when all that other stuff is stripped away, because you're right, like the five out stuff lends itself to easy isolation, easy buckets. But when you strip all of it away and you just sort of default right into isolation and walk into those things, then you're kind of losing all of your inherent advantages with the roster that you've put yep. together here. And so um, they they need to get better. I, mean, I don't know. They could get better. Maybe. I don't know that they need to get better to win the championship. But if you're poking on a hole in the Celtics, that's 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 it. I have a short Celtics take. Let's do that. It. Kind of shoots down everything we just said. Uh, they're not playing great right now. Obviously, they just lost two in a row to the same team, which is unusual. Uh, you know what happened in last March, Wes? Do you remember this? Uh, the Denver Nuggets did not give a single F about the month of March. And were right. like 500 for a month and a half to end the season. And then absolutely stomped everybody in the playoffs. Like, yeah. once you clinch the first seed, it, it's got to be so hard to to care like what yeah. are you playing for i These mean you saw at the nothing. end of the the first hawks loss boston the way they talked about it was just like yeah that wasn't our best performance but we'll be fine Whatever. and then at the <laughs> end of this one you've got jalen brown trading jerseys with dejounte murray i'm like you don't care at all that you just lost no. an overtime game and played more minutes than you needed to so uh maybe maybe you're right uh what does the timberwolves sale mean for the future of the team on the court we'll get to that next here unlocked on nba Today's episode of Lockdown NBA is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is what brings home winning the, the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It was a fun night of hoops, even though it was only two games. The only other game on Thursday, the Pelicans beat the Bucks 107 to 100. Giannis had 35 points, including 20 in the third quarter, but Zion had 28, including 11 in the fourth quarter to put this nice. one away. CJ McCollum nice. added 25. The Pelicans have won 11 of their last 15 games, or a half game out of fourth. So that was the other game that happened. I have tonight. a declaration but, before okay. we talk about the Timberwolves. Zion is back. Zion took 16 back. free throws. Zion is back. If the, <laughs> I'm never ready for the soundboard. If that's what the Brandon Ingram injury means, I'm all. <laughs> it sucks to not see Ingram, but holy smokes, does he look good? I, okay, let's talk. I about love. The I love the Pelicans. I'm all in on the Pelicans defensively. They're totally locked in. Zion is playing. He, he was looks guarding awesome. Giannis at the start of this one. Yeah. Uh, and Giannis was guarding him, and it was a lot of fun. And they kind of swapped the the, the the matchups a little bit as the game went on. What the Pelicans are doing with their screens to sort of set up Zion below the three-point line, kind of get him downhill. That first step is back, and now because that first step is back, they're able to set these screens like in the paint, and he doesn't need that much runway to get going, and it's nearly impossible to stop those things. Uh, I thought the Bucks ended up getting back into this game when they started doubling Zion in the paint. Brooke and Giannis both just sort of collapsing on him. 
And, you know, Zion couldn't find the passes sometimes over all that size. And, and the Bucks, you know, the Giannis did Giannis things and they end up getting back into this game. But um, once Brandon Ingram comes back, I think it's going to help them a lot because there's weird things with they have to play Larry Nance in these in like their closing lineup because they don't really have a better option. They're not going to tr- trust like Jordan Hawkins in those moments. Dyson Daniels is still out like they don't have another person that they really trust. They don't want to put Valanchunas out there in those in those situations. But if you swap Brandon Ingram, a legit floor spacer, for Larry Nance, who like Giannis was just playing off of in the fourth quarter, you can't play off of Brandon Ingram, obviously, in that way. And I think it's it's just going to open up everything. I, I think that's going to have a real domino effect with the way that they've sort of found things and the way that they're clicking here. But let's move on to the Timberwolves' ownership situation. There's a lot to get into. Uh, so just bear with me. I'm going to just try to do a like a quick like <laughs> BuzzFeed explainer on this. Uh, so for the last three years... Current owner Glenn Taylor had been working to sell a majority stake in the Timberwolves franchise to Mark Lore and Alex Rodriguez. So then on Thursday, Taylor releases a statement saying that the opportunity for Lore and A-Rod to take control of the franchise has expired and that the team is no longer for sale. Very surprising. Taylor said that the Lore A-Rod group did not meet certain financial benchmarks and that their opportunity to take control of the team has expired. At the end of his statement, Taylor said, quote, I will continue to work with Mark, Alex, and the rest of the ownership group to ensure our teams have the necessary resources to compete at the highest levels on and off the court. The Timberwolves and Link, Lynx are no longer for sale. So that led Lauren Arod to put out a statement saying, quote, we're disappointed with Glenn Taylor's public statement today. We have fulfilled our obligations, have all the necessary funding, and are fully committed to closing our purchase of the team as soon as the NBA completes its approval process. Glenn Taylor's statement is an unfortunate case of seller's remorse that is short-sighted and disruptive to the team and the fans during an historic winning season, end quote. Then Taylor goes on to tell The Athletic that Lauren Arod had their time and that this is the end of the contract and we're just going to go on running the way we've been running. I've just built this team, he said. We've got the players now, and it appears to me that we should have a very positive run for a number of years and I want to be part of that. So, Tony, what do you make of all of this? Why do you think Glenn Taylor ended the deal? Um, I can't find the exact quote, and I don't want to say something that didn't happen. But I believe Glenn Taylor was on the radio talking about this, too, today. If I had to make an educated guess, Wes, I would say what happened is that the Timberwolves are worth a little bit more now than they were when this deal started. And it took a long time, uh, it sounds like specifically for A-Rod, but in general, that ownership group, to get the funds required to actually do the transaction. And I I can't remember, I think Hoop Collective was talking about this, Brian Windhorst was, about like this month being the deadline for them to get the funds and actually complete this. And apparently that deadline was yesterday, two days ago now, and they didn't make it, according to Glenn Taylor. They think they did make it, which is interesting. But if if Glenn Taylor... thinks that the team is worth more now and he has any sort of contractual out where he can either keep the team or resell it in the future. And he, the sneaky part of this, he also owns the Lynx who have certainly gone up in value with WNBA and women's basketball's rising viewership could also be a part of this. You know, I, I, I don't know anything obviously, but it sure seems like that would be a part of it, especially yeah. with how dragged out this process has been because for a while it felt like Glenn Taylor was like, for a while looking to sell the team to anyone who would buy it. Now it's the opposite. Yeah. And they were getting along. And then, you know, there's been reporting around it for like the last few months that maybe they weren't getting along as much that A-Rod and Laura weren't going to be able to come up with the, with the money. And there's definitely a gray area in terms of those financial benchmarks that yeah. were put in place, whether the funds were there or then, you know, the time between submitting approval paperwork and then that approval paperwork being approved by the league and all these things. So there's definitely a gray area, but to your point, Tony, I think you're exactly right. So Glenn Taylor sells the, the Timberwolves for $1.5 billion in 2021. But the Timberwolves have Anthony Edwards, one of the bright young American players in the league right now. They are winning a bunch of games. Uh, Laura and A-Rod were a big part of what got Tim Connolly there and kind of and started this whole process of go- kind of going all in on this Anthony Edwards thing. So they sell for $1.5 billion three years ago, but they're going to be, like, if they sold now, they'd probably be closer to $3 billion because you got a franchise player with Anthony Edwards. You look at what the Mavs recently sold for, the Hornets. Like, $3 billion kind of feels like the floor for an NBA team right now. Oh, and so yeah. 
they're you know Laura and Aaron in twenty twenty one agree to make kind of these step payments. They don't they're not going to buy it all in full. Because had they had the money, I guess, maybe they would have just bought it all in full and got it at one and a half billion. And maybe that thing would have doubled within three years. But because they're making these step payments, Glenn Taylor kind of is able to maneuver this out in a way where he's like, oh, my God, I think I left two billion dollars on the table potentially here. How where how can I find an out on this? So this is going to go to mediation or arbitration or something like that. And this is going to take a while. I feel like there is a legal battle coming and it could be a distraction to what happens on the court. But the other part of this too with Minnesota is that they've got a big luxury tax bill coming up. They've got decisions to make about, are we gonna trade Carl Anthony Towns or one of these other players? And if they don't really know where the money is coming from, that could force them to either sell, or not sell the team, I mean, but like, or cut payroll dramatically. If they're not sure like what kind of funding that they're gonna have, who's in charge here, who's paying the bills and who's paying the luxury tax if they do indeed have to pay that. So. I'm really interested to see how that works out too, because if this arbitration mediation process takes a very long time, it'll probably take longer than just this summer when all these decisions are going to have to be made. And and I think the other, other factor is there's a new media rights coming up next year. Now it's 2024 it's next year. And perhaps if that's looking rosy values would go up in that way too. So maybe a tenable way to keep your team together, even if it would still be expensive, like it, it will be hard, but at least possible if the league is healthy enough from all that. And that, you know, who no one knew what was on the horizon four years from now in 2021 when this originally started. So uh, it, it's pretty interesting because I think both part, <laughs> this is the lame answer for a podcast guy to say, but like both parties are totally justified to say exactly what they said. So it's like impossible to know what's actually going on behind the scenes because one party says, yeah, we got the money yeah. and we signed all the paperwork. And the other side says, no, you didn't meet this one deadline and I want to keep the team now. So I don't know what's going to happen because it sounded like from reporting like last week, it was going to go to the board of governors. So this one could get, I don't, I don't want to say messy, but when there's this much money at stake, maybe so. Biggest winner out of all of this law firms and their billable hours. <laughs> this is going to take a minute. Uh, this is going to take a minute. Um, what are the most important games for seeding during this final stretch? We're going to build your watch list next here on Locked on NBA. Today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have the lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. Let's start with the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built in is your is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. A made up word that's used for cars. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid size crossover for your next adventure. Let's also talk about the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It has room up to eight in expensive cargo capacity and advanced available 4x4 capability with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is your answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experience with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you could plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the, in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and a whole lot more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, well, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash TV. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. 
It's Friday, which means it's time to count down to the weekend with our weekly power rankings. I'm a system player. I am a system player. Your face when that comes on these last couple of weeks, <laughs> it should be the thumbnail on YouTube. Adam enjoys I can't, that. I just want to say. <laughs> I can't. Adam likes the song. Take it up with me. I, I have no comment. <laughs> All right. Uh, Le- reach out to down. my representation. <laughs> we're counting down <laughs> the top five games left this season for seeding purposes. So every team in the league has somewhere around 10 games left. The race in the West for the play-in is crazy. Obviously, at the top of the conference, it's nuts. 4-5 could be different. 6-7 is a whole other thing. Are the Warriors going to make the play-in tournament at all? Are they going to miss the playoffs altogether? All these things. And then the Eastern Conference. Yes, you have the Celtics at the top. Then you have the Bucks right under them. But then the Cleveland Cavaliers and the New York Knicks. What's going on there? The play-in race there. Who's going to be six? Who's going to have to play and, and get that guaranteed playoff spot? Who's going to be in that play-in tournament? All these races are a big deal. But let's count down the top five games that are going to impact the seeding going forward. So basically what this is for our viewers, it's a watch list, right? Circle these games, make sure you watch them because they're going to be huge with a playoff-like atmosphere. The first one we're going to do, Thunder Suns this Friday, tonight. Thunder Suns. So right now the Oklahoma City Thunder are in third, tied for second. In the Western Conference, uh, they're technically third right now because of tiebreaker and stuff like that. They're 50 and 22. The Phoenix Suns, meanwhile, are seventh as we're recording this. They're 43 and 30. So this isn't like necessarily a big game for them in terms of like against each other. It's not like the Thunder and the Suns are gonna are, are battling for the same playoff seed in the West. But if the Thunder win this game, obviously they can move up to a tie for the number one seed. And if for even more importantly for Phoenix, they need every win that they can get. And especially one in conference against a team like the Thunder could help them uh, get out of that, that play in tournament and get one of those top six seeds. So that's our first one. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. The sun's schedule is nuts. Like it's bananas. How hard their last 10 games are. I think the easiest game they have the rest of the way is like new Orleans or Cleveland. Um, but yeah, it, it's not like good. the Thunder game is huge for them, specifically every team against West games. They have another one that I hope we get to, but uh, every single Suns game is like bananas <laughs> the rest of the way. It's crazy. We do have one more Suns game on this list, but not now. Right now, another Friday night game, another game tonight, Kings versus Mavericks. Crazy. So this Insane. one is exactly two teams battling for the same seed. The Dallas Mavericks hanging on to that sixth spot right now, 43 and 29. The Sacramento Kings just a game behind them in that eighth seed right now at 42 and 30. If they win this game, they just move up into that sixth seed. Or it depends, I guess, if Phoenix wins against them. Oh, it's, it's, it's wild. The whole thing is crazy. I'm not really <laughs> sure what happens. All I know is that this game is wildly important. Important. A lot at stake. You don't want to, I know and, that there's a few games left, but you don't want to wake up any day and be like, ah, oh, now we're in the play in. Kings clinch the tiebreaker if they win ah. tonight. Mavs would have to win, and then I think it's... I'm not even going to sit here and tell you know the conference record of the Mads and Kings off the top of my head, but that would be the, the next thing. Uh, it appears they're very close right now. They're yeah, half a game they're apart. They're actually... So. Dallas is 27 and 19 in conference. Sacramento is 27 and 18. God. Oh, this that, is, see, every game, man. Every game is insane the rest of the way. I would say it would be it, but like there's 40 other teams in between 5 <laughs> and 9 in the, in the West, so it's like I don't... I have no idea how important oh. this game is, but it feels really important, and it's tonight. All right, so this is the two games tonight. Now let's flash forward over the next couple of weeks. The next one, the one that you were referencing before, Kings Suns, April twelfth, banger, second to last game of the season for both teams. I mean, this is a playoff game, probably. A lot can happen between now and April twelfth, but it feels like we're gonna we're gonna end up in a place where this game is still gonna be very important. Sacramento yeah. has to win this to tie the season series. So if they lose. Not only do they lose a game on the Suns, but they also lose any sort of potential tiebreaker. So there could be a situation going into this game where the Kings actually have a better record than Phoenix, maybe by a game, and the Suns can win this game, tie Sacramento in record with just one game left in the regular season, and take the tiebreaker. This is huge. 
huge. I, I don't know if either of these teams can catch the Red Hot Mavs. We've won five in a row, but even hosting the play-in is vital compared to going on the road for that 7-8 yeah. game. Like, I think every seven seed ever in the play-in has made it out, and there's been an eight seed that's gotten knocked out like every year, like Gold State, Cleveland, whatever. Like, it's huge to host that game, and you host the next game if you lose. Like, it is such a yeah. big margin change. So even yeah. if they aren't fighting for six anymore, it's a huge game. Yeah, the Heat were the seventh seed last year. They lose to Atlanta in the 7-8 game, but then they get that game was at home. They get the second game at home against Chicago, and they, they go to the play Milwaukee Bucks in the first round. And then we what know happened, what happened to the Heat in the playoffs last year? They lost. They the finals. The That's finals. right. It's like these playing <laughs> games matter quite a bit. Two conference finalists from the play-in last year. That's it right. matters. Yep. Go playing. Go playing. Number four, speaking of the play-in. Warriors at Rockets, April. Yes, you got it 4th. in here. I didn't know if you'd do this one. Of course. Houston can't get the tiebreaker. They've already lost the tiebreaker over Golden State. Um, but they can gain ground on that play-in spot. So while we're recording this, Golden State is 38 and 34, a game over the Rockets, who have won 10 games in a row. They're 37 and 35. They are cruising. Alperen Sangoon, no problem. We've got Jabari Smith Jr. at center. We got space. Jalen Green is turning into a star right before our eyes. They've got the Thompson twin doing things. Um, this game could be very important, and it kind of just feels like a game that the Warriors would lose this season, doesn't it? It does. Uh, the next two games for Golden State are Charlotte and San Antonio. And the Rockets play the Jazz tonight and then have two harder games. So, like, there's a chance if if all the results go as expected up until this game that it's like close to the Rockets' last gasp to sneak up there because then they'd be three back and no tiebreaker. And I want the Rocket. This is crazy. That like I don't know if you were like this, but all season I thought it's over. The, the top ten oh, yeah. in the West is settled after the break, and now it's ten in a row is insane. I I'm I'm all in time. on the Rockets, even though I'd rather watch Steph in the playoffs. But it's For very sure. cool what they're doing. No, I think you know. The NBA is going to be rooting hard for Steph. I'm going to go out on a limb and say Draymond is not getting ejected from this game <laughs> unless he goes into the stands and just goes complete malice in the palace. Like, I don't. What is uh is the number one game on this list going to be a game that you and I both are going to care quite a bit about Ooh. by chance? You know it. I had to put it. <laughs> number one, the most important game in the NBA over the next couple of weeks, April 7th, Heat Pacers. Woo. Woo. Tony, Woo. I don't have to tell you what's at stake here. Winner gets the tiebreaker. Both of these teams, and this is why it's the biggest one. We're not talking about, okay, like a Warriors or Rockets team. Maybe they make it the play-in. Who cares? Like both of these teams will lose probably in the play-in round. And if somehow they advance all the way to the playoffs, they'll lose in the first round. Like small potatoes, right? We're not talking about a whole lot here. But the Indiana Pacers and the Miami Heat, the Pacers, the darlings of the NBA this year. Tyrese Halliburton, <laughs> maybe he finds his his footing after this hamstring mess. Pascal Siakam in the fold. Like, that's a legit team that can make some noise in the playoffs. The Miami Heat, as we know, no team wants to play them in the playoffs. The difference for these teams is that it's either a guaranteed spot in the playoffs as the number six seed or having to toil through the play-in tournament to make the playoffs. I don't know that there's... To me, that's the most interesting version of this like playing tournament, like seedings race thing is is yeah. six seven. It's the the guaranteed playoff berth versus having to play one or two games to make the playoffs. Nobody wants to be in that playing tournament, not with all that variance, not with everything at stake. I am fascinated by this. The Pacers right now a game up on Miami, but this Tied in the loss column is a must in the loss right not in the loss column right. Yep, mm -hmm. uh, both teams with thirty three losses right now. This is it. This is the game. This is the game that's going to determine who gets that six seed. It certainly looks that way. Uh, and the Heat have a pretty cupcakey schedule leading up to it. So it's unlikely that it just straight up doesn't matter unless one of the teams just tanks. So the difference between this and the West six, seven, eight is uh, I am predicting. So this is a little projecting, but is that Suns Kings is likely a seven, eight game. And Mavs Kings is tonight. This is. The fourth to last game of the season, 4-6, very likely. Like, that is as big as it gets, and the Pacers have never been there, and the Heat have been everywhere. So it's like <laughs> the absolute opposite ends of the spectrum contrast. It's going to be fun. Uh, here's the problem. The the Pacers want to make the playoffs quite badly. 
for the first time with this era of the team. But the coolest possible thing is Pacers Bucks in the first round and Heat Knicks in the first round. And that's only possible if the Heat wins. So we'll see what actually ends up shaking out because uh, I want good first round matchups and those are objectively the best. Ones. They are. Uh, well, we will see what happens. There's your watch list. The five games that you have to circle, that you have to watch if you're an NBA fan. Thanks for making Lockdown NBA your first listen every day.